This is the Aurelius Podcast, episode 40 with Jane Portman. I'm Zach Naylor, co-founder at Aurelius and your host for the Aurelius Podcast, where we discuss all things UX, research, and product. This time, I got a chance to chat with Jane Portman, co-founder at UserList and host of the UI Breakfast Podcast. She's got quite the impressive background as not only an accomplished UX consultant, but as a founder of a few different businesses prior to UserList. As I mentioned, she also hosts her own podcast discussing UX design and related topics. She and I had a chat about her experience in starting a SaaS business and how that's helped her become a better UX designer. She also shared some really excellent tips and pointers you can learn from starting a business and how to apply that in helping you become a better UX designer and researcher. Learning more about business and understanding those internal needs is a recurring theme of our podcast, and Jane is an awesome guest to have on to discuss those very things. I'm certain you're going to get some very actionable takeaways from this episode. The Aurelius Podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the powerful research repository and insights platform. Aurelius helps you analyze, search, and share all your research in one place. Check us out at AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. Okay, let's get to it. Hey, Jane. Hey, Zach. How are you going? Everything is great. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, of course. Really happy to have you on. It was kind of a funny turning the tables, right? Because we, I think, originally met because I was a guest on your show, I think, a couple of years ago now. It's been a while, right? Ages ago, yes. Yeah. So the if for those of you who don't know, I mean, Jane runs her own podcast, which is awesome. Have a lot of uh, really, really awesome guests. I was nice enough to meet her through that, and we had a, a conversation about product strategy, design strategy, that kind of thing. But uh, now <laughs> tables have turned and we've got her on our show. So what I'd like to do is just in case anybody who might not be familiar with you and the work that you do, maybe, you know, introduce yourself, give a little bit of background of, you know, sort of what you do, things you're passionate about. So I've been in design for ages, basically, I think up to 15 years by now. When my first son was born, at that point, I was a creative director at an agency, managing designers, projects and everything. And then I just realized that I burnt out. So I started a solo career online, just doing what I do best, UI, UX design. And that's when I started my personal brand, UI Breakfast. That's kind of the root name of everything I do. Started UI Breakfast podcast shortly afterwards. And the podcast just turned six years old, which is a lot of time. We are approaching 200 episodes. Uh, A lot of things have changed throughout the years. Projects came and go. Then I had a number of consulting clients. I started up at Upwork, which was called Odesk back then. I spent a tiny bit of time there, just, you know, getting an idea how things work. And then my goal was to basically get out of there and never have to go back there again. (laughs) So um, I did this uh, consulting drill. And uh, I think I was inspired by a post by Patrick McKenzie. And he taught me the basics of how to anchor your work to value, how to charge more and everything. Then I got inspired by Nathan Berry and his authority book that teaches people to basically write for authority. That's what I did in back in 2013. I wrote my first book, which didn't make any money. After that was more books. By now it's, it's four. And then I also dipped my toes in SaaS. And uh, right now I'm in the middle of my second SaaS journey, which now is like in full swing and serious. Right now, since January, I'm full time on my SaaS product together with my co-founder, Benedict. Product is called UserList. And and we picked an extremely complex (laughs) niche and product for ourselves. It's a customer messaging tool that helps SaaS founders talk to their users via automated email or in-app messages, and it involves a ton of uh, a ton of very complex tasks, <laughs> really. That's where my time goes these days. I keep running the podcast, but I hope we'll be able to talk today how my understanding of the business universe evolved as more books went out, as I grew my audience from scratch over the years, and um, what I really think about this all these days. And uh, I'm so excited to share this. That's awesome. Well, that's exactly why I wanted to have you on because I knew a bit about your journey and your background just from us having been acquaintances. And I can point to some areas of your background that sound very much like mine in the journey that I took, just kind of starting as a designer, more even like front end developer, honestly, and then slowly but surely working closer and closer with the business. And now 
obviously we have our own product, Aurelius. It's a research tool, so it's a little bit different where I kind of stayed in the industry I started in, both of us having started as UX people, now starting their own businesses. And I know personally, I have learned so much that makes me a better designer from having started a business. And I would love to hear from you, you know, some things that you have learned and what you think other folks in our field, UX research, should know about that. So, I mean, maybe start with what made you decide to start UserList, right? To go in and say, we're going to build a SaaS tool. Hey, I'm a UX person, but this is what I want to do now. It's interesting that in spite of the fact that I was a UX consultant myself, for the last like five years or something, I've been focusing entirely on SaaS products. And instead of hanging out with uh, fellow designers, I was hanging out with uh, fellow SaaS founders. This concept of this lifestyle business of bootstrap SaaS, it really, really resonated with me. And I was aspiring to follow that track for a while. In 2017, 16, I started my first SaaS product that didn't go anywhere, was a small productivity tool. So Userless is actually a second product. With tiny reminder, that first tool that I later sold for a small amount of money, Benedict, my co-founder, he was my developer for hire. So immediately when that first tool was shut down, I was like, I need the next one and I had more ambitious plans and it was impossible to do this without a technical co-founder. So I recruited him and I also recruited Claire Solentrop. She later transitioned into an advisor role. So she's no longer with us on the team, but she's there as the founder of the company. Now she focuses on her forget the funnel marketing stuff. I've heard of forget the funnel. Yeah. So herself and her co-founder Gia, they put out an amazing amount of awesome marketing content out there. That was a pretty serious undertaking. It was long wanted to adopt this mindset. If only I knew (laughs) that being a SaaS founder is such a huge challenge. And I really would not recommend this way of making money online to anyone, except for (laughs) if you're up for like really big pain, like for a long while, (laughs) because getting a SaaS product off the ground is nowhere near info products. Like info products are much, much, much easier to make money online. Getting out a book per year and generating some cash with it will make you wealthier way faster than trying to grow your SaaS. I think that's the recipe. Even though this model of recurring revenue and bringing value to the world, of course, it's attractive. And that's why we are there to build something useful and to make sure that our skills and uh, the way to build awesome products is that are really useful to uh, to the customers. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that's really interesting, too, that you've done this. You started a couple of different businesses, right? Because you you did it, like you said, with information products, so knowledge, books, uh, that kind of thing. You did your own consulting. That's your own business. And then now said, okay, well, SaaS. Just for those that are not familiar with SaaS, we're talking about software as a service. So basically software, like you would sign into Gmail or uh, Trello or anything like that. Those are all SaaS products for Anybody unfamiliar with the acronym, but <laughs> it was funny to me where you said, I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. Tell me a little bit more about, you know, about why you say that. There are some obvious challenges there. What comes to mind as to why you say that? Info products are largely an impulse buy, and they don't come with much of a relationship that you have to build with the customer. And they just purchase it and they can consume the knowledge you provide or they can keep it on their shelf. You particularly don't care because you already have the cash in the bank. And generally speaking, they might like your book, they might not like your book, they might ask for their money back in some very extreme and rare cases. But generally speaking, you're you're fine. The amount of support is very low. With SaaS, you really have to drive to prove uh, the value of, of the product that you're providing. May, selling something for like $9 a month on a repeatable basis for something that that a service does is much harder than, I don't know, selling a $200 book or $100 book, really, because that's just a one-time commitment. And getting into a relationship with the SaaS business is another different story. It's much, much harder to start those kinds of relationships. So the conversions are harder to make. The people are harder to retain. It's all kinds of struggles. I thought that with the user list in particular, we are there pretty close to the money, The value is pretty proven. Uh, It's a pretty known marketing category. And yet we still have our own struggles here because the customer acquisition, on the other hand, is a pain. And it's uh, it's quite a big set of work that needs to happen in order for users to start receiving value. And therefore, 
it's definitely not a walk in the park. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of things that you're describing, for what it's worth, are the same kind of challenges we have. I, just to share a little bit from our perspective, it's particularly difficult, I think, with gaining that trust and earning earning that business, honestly, for other designers and researchers, because that's our target. And so if you consider, <laughs> you're literally trying to earn the trust and respect of people who build great products. It just adds like a whole new level. And we have certainly seen a lot of the same things that you have. One of the things I want to ask you, so direct to the point, having been a UX person and now having been a person who started several different kinds of businesses, do you think that that's made you a better UX designer? Absolutely. <laughs> Unquestionably so. The most important thing is better understanding of your place in the world as a UX designer and how, on one hand, of course, great UX is essential to software success. But on the other hand, it's such a minuscule part of all the processes and limited resource game that's going on, that's happening in the SaaS and the software world in general. It's really a small place. It would take you a couple of days to design. It will take two months for the developers to build enormous resources. Then it will take ages for a support team and the customer success team to work around those features. It's just such a small task compared to the rest of other tasks that the founders have. And I didn't even touch on sales and marketing, which is absolutely uh, the essential thing that's often overlooked. It seems that, you know, you will design a product and it's going to be great. Um, you will build it and people will come. Well, I'm sure if, if someone's listening and has never done a product, you might have this understanding, thinking, but it's, it's definitely not like this. You have to do very serious work. And I would say sales and marketing efforts are much more challenging than product work. With product, you're basically sure what you do. You're aware of input of the hours versus output in terms of like good product or something. With sales and marketing, it's a very different game. Yeah. I'm actually really glad that you touched on the sales and marketing piece because I think I will only speak for myself, but I can say much earlier in my career, many, many years ago, let's say about 10 years ago now, I used to think sales and marketing were bullshit. I used to think it was like smoke and mirrors and just trying to convince people to do stuff. And what really mattered was how awesome the product was, how great the UX was, because that's where, that's the world I lived in, right? I was purely a UX person. I couldn't agree more that starting a business makes me realize, and you said it in such a great way, like your place in the world. Again, because it's uh, coming from the industry that I did, it's not to say at all UX is not important. Of course it is. It's still, to me, one of the most important things in a product, but that's just it. It's the product. A business is so much more than just the product you build. You talked a little bit too, like you mentioned the funnel, your one co-founder, forget the funnel, and just even the funnel of like engaging with a business, particularly a SaaS business, a software product. If we have a great experience, and that great experience delivers on these features that somebody might find later in the product when they've like fully adopted it and got on board, that's great. But there are all these things that need to be designed and considered and planned for to even get somebody to that point. Which, by the way, are experiences to design, but they have nothing to do with that feature that you made. For a software product, well-designed marketing website is, I don't know, thousands of times more important than what's inside the product. And it's pretty sad because the product itself matters. There is a very sad discrepancy that I've seen many times as a consultant that there is a well-designed marketing site and then there is something not right happening on the inside. A good sign that things are right is that the product is still making money. So throughout these years that I've been consulting for other software products, my favorite client is a kind of business that's been making money in spite of poor internal UI. That's not an obstacle. Like basically, if you're solving a big enough problem, Great UX, unfortunately, is not necessary. Yes, yeah, sure, there are great consumer products that scale to like millions of users that we're used to seeing, like, I don't know, Dropbox kind of uh, tools, but certainly not all software in the world looks like that. Yeah, I'm really, really happy to hear you say that because it's been some of my impression as well. It's difficult for the UX community to stomach in some cases, right? Especially if you're new in your career to say your product and your business can be successful in spite of bad UX. Like, interestingly enough, a lot of earlier stage companies, this is the reason why they don't have those people. They don't hire UX folks right away is because dependent, you know, this thing that you said, understanding your place in the world, understanding where the business is. If this is one of the only players in the space, 
the problem getting solved is valued enough. How it happens and the experience of the product and the design matter just so much less. But, you know, on the other hand, different extreme situation where you look at like an email provider, there's so many different options or commerce sites. There's so many different options where the experience there matters so much because there's so much competition that that can be a differentiator. I think being able to understand your place in that and the importance of not only, you know, UX, but like which parts of the UX in that product matter the most to not only get new customers, keep customers, have returning customers, like all these things matter so much than maybe even just a beautiful interface. Businesses with the design co-founder, they have a major advantage because not only you can have great UX inside the product, then you can have consistently great website uh, that also relates to the quality of the inside of the product, which is great. So there is no such discrepancy that I discussed, I mentioned before. And you can also establish like consistent flow of uh, nice looking marketing materials, which also it's big spending of money for people who don't have a designer in-house. That's a big struggle to keep the website and the marketing stuff all in line brand early on without having to hire an expensive agency. But it's a mistake to think that it's by itself a recipe for success. I did have such kind of thinking early on. I thought this kind of advantage would be mission critical. But no, you still have to solve all these acquisition problems and everything from scratch, regardless of whether you are having great design or not. Unfortunately, that's the sad truth. Yeah, I found myself in a a similar situation in cases where sometimes I was interviewed recently for something and they were asking about my day-to-day job (laughs) as a founder, designer. And I was like, you know, the funny thing is most of my day (laughs) is spent doing sales and marketing and not designer products at all. You know, I try to keep a good 50-50 balance there. It's true. There's just so many other things that happen there. It's almost like what I tell people is the product part is easy for me. I've done that my whole career. It's everything else that's a really big challenge. I'm curious, like, have you seen, you've been able to live in both worlds, somebody running and growing your own SaaS product, your own software business. Do you see any patterns with UX designers, the UX community and how they approach work that, you know, you just wish they knew something about business that would actually help their work or help their approach on how they do this work better? There's so many things that you can learn to be a good uh consultant, be a good UX consultant, the designer. And it comes on so many levels. Firsthand, there is that business of consulting. So we were talking the business of software the last few minutes. And there is another whole thing of the business of consulting so that there is the etiquette, the way you sell your services in a manner that's efficient for everybody, the way you position your services based on the value you deliver, not on the hours spent. Definitely practicing in general with your own products makes you a better product designer because you start thinking about different things. And even if it's a book, you get a fraction of that stress that uh, software owners experience when they try to sell it. Trust me, the, the level of that stress is even higher with the software. But even with when you try to sell a paid newsletter or an ebook, the, the basic the step one of uh, the product game is still going to give you an idea of how that's marketed, how to write a sales page, write a sales page for your product, for your service, for your, I don't know, personal website. By the way, we did mention writing, but that's like, that's been a cornerstone of my entire career. Basically, I think I write way more than I design ever. That's a very essential skill. It all started those, I don't know, it was like eight years ago now. I designed a consulting site and I showed it to my client from Australia. And he was like, Jane, your writing is not great. I'm like, why? It's literate. I don't make English spelling mistakes. He's like, no, you should study some business writing. And he pointed me towards the books by Joanna Weeb. That's when it started, started spinning. I read them. It was like a whole big revelation of what business writing is about and sales copy and all that jazz. Designers often think that if they have nifty black and white page with some of their works that's going to sell their services or the UI is going to sell itself. No, you have to write about it as much as you have to design it. Wonderful advice. We didn't touch on writing at all. This is something that when I was still doing a lot of active UX work, design or strategy work, is I tried to help people understand a lot more importance needs to be placed on how you talk about the work you're doing or how you talk about the thing you're building in the way in which you describe it so that it connects with 
what's valuable to somebody as opposed to just describing or laying out the details of that thing. So like a good example of that, and you say business writing, Joanna Weeb's awesome. The stuff that they put out is amazing, super helpful for anybody, designers alike, right? But not just copywriters or even conversion copywriters, but, you know, <laughs> writing a, a website, for example, it's not just a matter of describing features about your product. It's about describing how your product helps somebody else be better. Those, those are very, very different things. You could sit here and describe technically, interactively, how your product works. People don't really care about that. What they want to know about is, if I use your thing, does it help me become better? Or does it help me solve some pain or problem that I have? That's just such a huge parallel to the work we do as UX people too, particularly even in user research. The whole idea is uncovering needs, expectations, pain points so that we can do things, design experiences to address them. Yeah, thankfully, UX and product designers, by the nature of our profession, we are exposed to the jobs to be done and all that, all kinds of frameworks that help uncover business goals. But don't forget to use the same stuff when you're selling your own work as well. So it's not about the features of your work, but also about the benefits that you bring to the table as a business. I used to write sales copy for my services that would say something like struggling with bad design or something. And you know, <laughs> nobody's particularly struggling with bad designs. Like among all the founders I hang out with, it's a small, tiny fraction that really struggles with bad designs. Usually it's um, keeping their customers, uh, re converting them from trial to paid and other things like that. That good onboarding can help them really make money. So maybe that can help you anchor your UX work to uh, what software founders need. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head with that, right? Where that's the way we would think of it. Well, your problem is bad design, but that's not how they would talk about that. That's not how they're considering it. They have other problems where, like you just, you just mentioned a few, people aren't signing up or people aren't staying or people aren't coming back. All of those things might be caused by bad design, but that's not how they would describe it. That's not what they care about solving. They might think design looks just fine because their definition of design might be different, right? But what you're really describing is, well, there's a problem that you have that the thing I can do can help with. Whether that's design or not, they almost don't care. But if you can help them solve that problem, then they're interested in chatting with you. The framework by Amy Hoy and Alex Hillman called 30 by 500. It was a system of different educational products about uh, how you run your software business. And the foundational idea that people need to know about products is why products actually exist, that they don't exist out of the blue, but they exist to serve the needs of an existing audience. It, sound, it might sound obvious to a large part of our listeners, but it's definitely not uh, baked in uh, like the design professional, unfortunately. You can very well, like prior to that, I was in design for five to 10 years and I was really missing this part very much like I was able to grow up to a management position and all I was working on was the internals of the products that were given to us and we never even questioned the reason why people need those products and how that's going to be sold because there was like a publishing house that would do that for us it's, it's pretty fascinating how how naive we can be for many years if we don't really touch upon the business side of things yes and that's it's such a passionate topic for me we talk about it a lot on this podcast. I feel like almost every guest we have on, almost every topic we've got somehow comes back around to this, where you can be a more successful UX person, UX researcher, whatever, by understanding business better. It's just a fact. And I continue to quote Christina Woodkey because it was one of the best episodes that illustrated this point where she said, a lot of designers out there, a lot of UX people have no idea how their business makes money. So you think about what that means. Essentially, everybody else in the business is working to help the business make money. That's its function, right? By providing some value. And so when people struggle, people uh, being like us you in the UX, in the research area, struggle with getting their ideas across or, or accepted or anything like that, but we haven't demonstrated that we understand how the business works, I always say, I always ask somebody, well, then why should they listen to you? If you haven't demonstrated your ability to listen to them and understand their job in the business in the greater context, why should they take your... Why should they take your suggestions? Absolutely. I just had a great conversation this week about the ROI of uh, UX work with Mark Baldino of Fuzzy Math, an agency in uh, Chicago. 
We talked for an hour about how hard it is for us designers to get on the table and like make sure those metrics that we need are in place to make sure that it's not that we're not just hired for cosmetic UI UX work, but that we're hired to make actual business improvements and how to measure the uh, this ephemeral uh, customer satisfaction and how you can even like really measure the effectiveness of the gig that uh, you're hired for. And in spite of the fact that I was pretty expensive, pretty accomplished consultant by the time I quit last December, basically. Um, And I was making very decent money. I was helping people solve their business problems. But I can say that I was never really taken to, I don't know, to like full business metrics kind of drill that I would love to be taken. Usually software founders have uh, limited resources and uh, such engagements that involve like going to the foundations of the business, they are much longer, much more expensive and Unfortunately, not so often given to solo consultants like I used to be. So, yeah, there is no easy answer. Yeah, no, that's very, very true. Because, you know, in my past career, I've I've sat on both sides of the fence. I've been a consultant at a services type company, you know, custom design and software shop. I've worked in-house at various levels to individual contributor to leader of teams, builder of teams. It's very, very different. I completely agree. And what's interesting is when I went back in-house, so to speak, after having worked at a services company for a while, my eyes were reopened to that. Tried to help my former colleagues at the services company understand like why you're struggling with getting this highly strategic, like very big business impact work as a services company is number one, it's uh, it's not cost effective. It's very expensive because a company essentially then needs to pay you to learn their business as well as they do and then make the thing that they need you to make. That's the first reason. The second one is, frankly, I don't think you'll ever get there. So you think about like the person hiring you, maybe even in your case, right? You've been working on your own SaaS product for how long? If you were to try to hire me... In total, like four years of product, of SaaS product. There you go. Yeah. So if you were to hire me as a consultant, would you ever expect me to have the same level of understanding of your business over the past four years that you have? Of course not. It would just be ridiculous. So it, it's a really difficult trust problem, honestly. And keep me honest, I think this goes back to understanding your place in the world, so to speak. If you are a consultant, right, understand like the value that you can help provide right away. I think lean into that. I think embrace that and understand the, the value you can help with. And by the way, and I'm speaking from experience here, when you do that, you demonstrate value in the thing that they need and, and kind of want immediately, you actually then earn a little bit of trust to this sort of a wedge offering up to say, you know, I can help you with some of these bigger sort of strategic problems that a lot of us tend to want to do even as consultants. In spite of of what we said before uh, in the last few minutes, there is still hope and you can absolutely advance yourself in this uh, food chain by doing some stuff on your own. You can, um, you know, preach first and then you might get to practice that in reality. (laughs) You know, you, you can absolutely write about this. You can start your own podcast, which is a nice way to, you know, distribute knowledge. If you get known even just a little bit for uh, those practices that you do, that you are close to the money, close to the business practices, then uh, you'll get similar kind of gigs. And whoever I'm hiring today as a founder, contractors and everybody, if I see someone who knows the world of SaaS and products even a little bit, that's like that's an instant hit that increases their chances of being hired exponentially. And you'd be surprised. I often do this uh, very (laughs) interesting activity of browsing profiles in Upwork, not for designers, but for, I don't know, marketing people, writers and everything. You'd be surprised how generic and sad their profile descriptions are. It would just take a few sentences of human English and uh, some business-oriented language to completely stand out in this ocean of generic uh, candidates out there. Yes, you shouldn't be on Upwork, likely in a much more advanced position, but still business writing and positioning yourself in the business system is uh, is just a great win for everybody out there. I would agree. You know, that's a really interesting point that you bring up too. Can you share any examples of maybe some of that generic language that you see and then maybe even give some advice for folks. Here's how you can do better with that. Because I think there's a lot of folks, it doesn't matter if you're a consultant or even looking to get hired at a company, they want to say, I want to help people understand how I can help them. I can be very strategic. I can do all these things. So can you maybe give us an example of like, here's what I've read. Don't do that. And then here's an example of what you should write. Absolutely. So the majority of the profile looks like this. Something like, I have extensive experience 
in the industry of uh, marketing. So I was I was looking for an email marketing specialist to do some competitive research for us. This was two weeks ago, literally. All the profiles there started with that. Very rare people just use human language. And you can only see like the first three lines, but that's already enough to understand that. And the person that I ultimately hired, they used, they started with the phrase, email marketing is a pain in the ass. Blah, blah, blah. I help you solve that. And I was like, oh my. <laughs> and not only it was human, but it was also provocative. And um, making the user stop in their track is basically a very, um, very common thing that cop- good copywriters can do. And it doesn't have to be necessarily friendly, but what he did was he definitely caught my attention. I was like, oh, a good copywriter here. Wonderful. Like, let's explore more. And then he had a longer description of what he can do. But basically, uh, just just being human and a little bit of that saving copywriting can take you a long way. That's a really great. That's a fun example, too. Uh, just trying to kind of distill down what you shared there into a couple um, summary points is the first one is stand out and you don't necessarily have to use that kind of language if you're not that kind of person, but be you <laughs> yeah. speak in a way that somebody can relate to, right? <laughs> Definitely. That's one of them. But then the second one, you know, that really made me think of uh, Simon Sinek and the whole start with why concept. Oh, my! F- that book is a discovery of 2020 for me before 2020 turned bad. <laughs> <laughs> it started off great and then it just went downhill yeah. from there. Yeah, it was. It's so mind-blowing how great his approach is to the entire business. Sorry I interrupted you. Please keep going. <laughs> no, that's that's okay. I was just going to say, though, I mean, a couple summary points is, one, stand out, catch somebody's attention by just being real. But then the second thing it made me think of was that whole start with why concept, which, again, for, for anybody unfamiliar, it doesn't start with describing I have skills with UX design, interface design, visual design, like nobody cares. Well, everybody has that kind of stuff or everybody can state they have that. If you start by catching someone's attention and go, I've helped people design websites that convert visitors into customers. Whoa, that's what I'm trying to do. And then later you describe how, right? You can say, well, I do this by doing research with people who might be your potential customers. And then I write good copy and I have experience, right? Like you don't start with those things because everybody's going to talk about those things, but talk about you and why it matters to somebody who's reading this. One of the other takeaways from the book was that those, so he analyzed business, successful businesses across like many decades uh, since the beginning of the century and why some of them survived and the others died and they couldn't transform. Because the successful companies do have a long-term mission, which is a goal that is above monetary gain for them. For example, I don't quite recall, he was comparing like photo printing slash digital companies. For one of them, the mission was to help people make better pictures. And this is always the case, no matter what the platform is, no matter what century you're in. They were doing great until they abandoned that when they changed course at some point. And they went after keeping their film business in place when everybody was transforming to digital. If they really focused on bringing value to this big goal, they would have uh, probably converted into digital and survived. It was about Kodak. There were uh, some great examples about Apple, Patagonia, and everything else. And you always have this big, somewhat unattainable, somewhat timeless goal that your business can serve. And uh, for us, for, at, at Usualist, that definitely is helping founders on, along their journey, making their journey more enjoyable with good tools. So that's a large enough mission that we can pivot inside that niche as much as we want, but we'll still be serving that founder image that is struggling on everyday basis, and we're helping them with good tools. I love that you established that even as such an early early stage technology SaaS company. We did the same thing actually with Aurelius where we said, you know, what we want to do, and this is funny how this came up too, because I imagine very much like you, <laughs> this came from some kind of personal experience, but, you know, having worked in the UX and the research and product strategy field, we said, if we're going to do this, like, w- like why? We can build a software product, but our mission is, you know, we want people to make informed decisions based on something that they learned from their customers rather than guesses and opinions and politics that happen inside companies. And those things drive design decisions and products and features. And we said, we want to help people make informed decisions. That's it. And it's just, it's like you said, it's so broad, but almost anything we do can 
help with that, but it's important because it actually helps focus your own decision making too, you know, where you can catch yourself every once in a while and go, are we doing the things that matter and whatever kind of impact we're trying to have? That goes back to the question that you asked in the beginning was why you have your product. And we discuss this a lot with my co-founder because there are always so many strategies your business can, you can take on a lot of funding. You can sell your business at a certain point. So what long goal do we have in mind? And for us, delivering value and receiving joy through that, having that enjoyable place of work that we own is number one goal. So like selling for a significant amount of money soon would mean that we've been working on something great. And then we have a little bit of money in the bank and we basically have to start from scratch. Like, and building a company from scratch is no small feat, really. Like those early years are, are quite hard. So selling at, at this point would make absolutely no sense, for example. Yes, sure, when we talk about like billions of dollars in 10 years, we'll have another discussion. But at this point, it's not that kind of money that can make you, you know, never work again. Likely not. And then if we have to work again, then we'll lose our awesome place to work. So that kind of thing, that helps you align what, what you do with your long-term goals. Yeah, I really appreciate that you have that long-term thinking too. I don't think it's as pervasive as we would like in society. It doesn't even matter what industry you're talking about. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, it's, again, the parallels between what you and your team are doing and what we're trying to do are very, very similar, you know? And so I just, I really appreciate that perspective selfishly. So I'm curious if, uh, if I were to ask you for folks listening to this, knowing that they're primarily, you know, UX research, product management people, if somebody were to ask you, okay, I didn't listen to the episode, but I want you to tell me what the top thing or the top three things I should know about business to help me be a better UX person. How would you answer that question? Learn business copywriting. That probably precedes everything. Learn how the businesses you serve uh, make money and understand what part of that money making belongs to your sphere of uh, expertise. <laughs> Experiment with your own products because you're going to fill yourself an entirely different role that's just going to elevate your thinking throughout, make you a more mature product person altogether. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. I love it. I would co-sign all of that. That's uh, very succinctly put to, I think, uh, covering all the ground that we had in our conversation. I want to be respectful of your time, Jane. This has been really, really awesome. And I know that we can for sure go probably for double or triple the amount of time, but we got to be respectful of that for you. The one thing I'll just ask is, uh, is there anything that you want to share with folks that maybe we didn't talk about or cover in the show so far? If you want to follow more of what I do, what we do as a team, you can always tune into UI Breakfast Podcast. We do our best to publish weekly. And you can also head over to userlist.com if you're interested in, in checking out like what, what my UX looks like in real life. <laughs> we're also launching a new podcast just about next week there at Userlist. And you can, it's called Better Done Than Perfect. And we are focusing on user onboarding, which is very relevant to UX. So I have already interviewed close to 10 SaaS founders and collected interesting stories. So that's going to be at userlist.com slash podcast. And that's a great example of how you parlay your skills, such as podcasting, to the software game. <laughs> yeah, welcome anytime. We're all there for spreading design knowledge. That's awesome. And congrats on the new show, too. I mean, you already have one successful podcast. And so, hey, why not just do another? <laughs> I think that that's really cool, too, because onboarding is such a big deal. I could say I'm frankly going to be checking that out because onboarding is an enormous deal with building a software product. And it's something that never ends. You're constantly improving. So I'll definitely go check that out. We'll include a link to that in the show notes, too, when you check out our episode on the site. With that, I'll just say... Thanks again, Jane, so much for joining us. This is a really great conversation. My pleasure. It was wonderful to reminisce about all these takeaways learned through the years. Awesome. All right. Well, that's it for this time. We will see you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Aurelius, the research and insights tool that helps you analyze, search, and share all your research in one place. So you can go from data to insights to action faster and easier. Check out Aurelius for yourself with a 30-day trial by going to AureliusLab.com. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S-L-A-B.com. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot 
if you would give us a review on iTunes to let others know what you think. You can catch all new episodes of the Aurelius podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts like iTunes, Spotify, and more. Stay up to date when new episodes come out by signing up for email updates on our website.